Hey, this is an impromptu video, a video that I was not planning to make, but it's the kind of video that I can't avoid making considering what happened in Israel and considering the Iranian attack that happened on Tuesday. So in the early evening of October the 1st, Iran launched 181, according to the IDF, ballistic missiles on Israel. Some sources say up to 200, but that's the ballpark number. This was in reply to a number of actions that the Israeli took against Iran and against Hezbollah in the past few months. This is a non-political video. In this video, we don't care who is right, who is wrong, who did what. Here, we just care about the events. And these events are important because for the first time, we can openly see what's the effectiveness of an integrated air defense built with Western technology against a massive attack with ballistic missiles from what could be considered an outsider by the Western world or with a different perspective, a medium technology country. And so it is interesting to see how they fared against a very sophisticated integrated air defense that was built on purpose for uh, generations now to defend Israel. And another interesting point is assessing the capability of these weapons to actually damage large objectives like air bases or on the flip side, to be capable of hitting with pinpoint accuracy point targets. Obviously, many of you will know that this is not the first time it happens. It happened already in April, but this has been very different. 98, 99% of all the weapons that have been fired at Israel have been intercepted. It didn't happen this time. Some interpret this as in April, Iran was doing a demonstration without wanting to cause real damage. This time they went for the target. So the question is, was it successful or not? So discussing the Iranian arsenal of ballistic missiles will require a long video in itself because Iran heavily, heavily invested in ballistic missiles as a form of conventional deterrence. The number of weapons that they possess is unknown. They don't give numbers. But there are some assessments that they possess more than 3,000 units, and I am inclined to believe that they actually possess a significant amount more than these 3,000 units. However, the most interesting element would be to understand the actual mix, because in that number there are relatively short-range weapons, but also medium-range weapons and intermediate-range weapons. To reach Israel from Iran, a missile should have at least a thousand kilometers range. So a significant fraction of the weapons in possession of Iran will probably not be capable of reaching Israel. In fact, many of these weapons are actually SCAD derivatives, where the SCAD is the old Soviet ground-to-ground -ground liquid fuel ballistic missile. But Iran has come a very long way from the SCAD missile, improving them, uh, increasing the range, the capabilities. And the most recent generation of Iranian missiles uh, is definitely modern and sophisticated. It wasn't easy to identify the models that have been used in the attack, even because I think that the Israelis don't know themselves exactly. However, some sources tried an identification. We have EMAD missiles, which is a 1700 kilometers range weapon, quite modern, with a 750 kilos warhead. And the reentry vehicle is actually a MARV, that is, it's capable of maneuvering either for adjusting the trajectory or to avoid the air defenses. The CEP is believed to be 10 meters, so relatively accurate. Another weapon that has been reported is the K-Bar, which is one of the most modern. It has a 1,500 kilos warhead, so it's a heavy weapon. It has a range of 2,000 kilometers. 
it is accredited of a circular error probability of 30 meters, but I mean, the warhead is quite heavy, so it's probably acceptable. The reentry vehicle is probably the most modern in the Iranian arsenal. It's capable of, of maneuvering outside the atmosphere. It features a few vernier rockets that orient the warhead point down, which means that it is more difficult to be identified by radars. It can execute evasive maneuvers. Just before you enter in the atmosphere, the Vernier jets start imparting a rotational movement to stabilize the warhead uh, during the atmospheric flight. And then they break the electronics because in this way it becomes insensitive to electronic warfare. So in the final stage, in the last 20,000 meters or so, it is purely mechanical. Another weapon that seems to have been used is the Fatah-1, which is a MARV, and it is accredited to be hypersonic in its flight, that is, reaches a very high speed even in the terminal stage of the trajectory. Curiously, I didn't find mention of the Shahab-3, which is often considered the workhorse of the Iranian ballistic missile fleet. However, this is a pretty old weapon, which is somehow considered obsolete by the Iranian themselves. It has the peculiarity of having a cluster warhead, in the sense the warhead splits in 5 to 150 separate warheads, but it doesn't have the maneuverability and the sophistication of the other three. About the Defender, well, Israel has built an integrated air defense with several layers of interceptors capable of protecting the country from this kind of ballistic attacks. So the famous Iron Dome is out of the picture because it is a short-range, low-altitude system for a much less sophisticated target. However, there are still at least three layers of defense above Israel. The first layer an attacker encounters is the Arrow 3, which is an exo-atmospheric interceptor that has the capability of intersecting a target above 100 kilometers, which is above the so-called Karman line, which is the uh, conventional limit of the outer space. It uses a maneuvering kill vehicle with a gimbal seeker that uses basically proportional navigation to home into the target. It, it can acquire the target after the launch. The guidance should be infrared, but it can probably receive guidance from ground-based radars. Infrared seekers work very well in space because the target looks like a fast-moving point against the backdrop of the very cold sky. So they're perfectly adequate and probably even better than radars. For them. The second layer of defense is the previous variant of the Arrow, the Arrow 2, that is deployed in various different blocks. It can still be considered an exo-atmospheric interceptor because it can reach an altitude of about 90 kilometers. Technically works not much differently than the Arrow 3. It's just a smaller and less kinematically capable weapon. The third layer of Israeli integrated air defenses is the David Sling. It is very capable against ballistic missiles. It features a very strange looking interceptor with dual guidance, infrared and radar, and it is believed to be effective up to about 25, 30,000 meters to catch the ballistic reentry vehicles in their terminal stage. We don't know the exact positions of the Israeli batteries, and there were no social media uh, videos posted of the interceptor's launch. However, the Arrow should cover an area of about 100 kilometers range, so you don't need that many batteries. The David Sling uh, can probably cover an area much smaller. So how did the attack go? Well, the official version from the IDF is that they intercepted the majority of the missiles aimed at Israel. There are also news that some U.S. ships fired SM-3s at these uh, missiles. The IDF says that there was uh, just minor damage to some infrastructures. There was just one person killed, unfortunately, 
by debris and a few other people wounded. So the Israeli version was that the attack wasn't much of an issue. That's an hurricane in case uh, you don't recognize it. Okay, let's go on after having been interrupted by a hurricane. These things happened only in England. So the Israeli version was that this attack was no big deal, that the damage was minor, that not that many missiles uh, broke through the air defenses, and all was well if we can use this word, in a situation like this. They supported this version by releasing a few pictures. One was a satellite image of Navatim Air Base where a hangar was uh, damaged in a, I would say, secondary area of the base, the area of the base where the non-combat aircraft are uh, operating. Then they released pictures of a crater in the center of Tel Aviv, uh, not too far from the Mossad headquarters. Not too far meaning uh, a few hundred meters. And then they released footage of the damage to a school near Tel Nof Air Base, where the missile actually hit the backyard. So the picture that they want to convey is clearly of minor damage and uh, attack to civilian infrastructures. However, the videos that have been posted on social media and the pictures that some open source intelligence organizations are trying to analyze paint a different story. You have to remember that there is a heavy censorship on every satellite picture of the state of Israel. High definition pictures, even those uh, taken by civilian organizations, are forbidden. So the analysis is objectively difficult. However, even I, with my modest experience, I could count up to 30 impacts in the videos posted on social media. So something else must have happened. So the target of the attack seems to have been four air bases, Hetzarim, Nevatim, Tel Nof, and Ovda in the south of Israel, and the Mossad headquarters in Tel Aviv. So the first comment is that the Israeli air defenses actually worked in the sense that we have videos depicting uh, exo-atmospheric interceptions that look very different from atmospheric interceptions. They look like a bluish purple blob that expands very quickly in space. Plus, in the videos, you can clearly see some of the weapons being hit, some explosions happening. Moreover, in the videos you can clearly see that some of the traces are slow and seem to lose material while they fall, so these are probably big uh, chunks of the breeze. However, there are plenty of high-speed, very clear impacts recorded on videos. The best documented attack is Nevatim, and it was the first the open source analyst tried to assess. And we have an analysis that shows about 32 hits around the base. However, we have to say that these hits are very dispersed. There are a couple of clusters in areas that are used by the combat aircraft. There are probably one or two impacts in areas where there are combat aircraft shelters and mine these bases where the F-35s are based. However, considering the fact that the United States uh, gave a couple of hours of warning to Israel, many of these would have been in flight. That's a reasonable assumption. So, at least in Nevatim, there is the possibility that some aircraft have been damaged, or at least some aircraft shelters have been damaged. However, the base seems to be completely operational. There are also a couple of images from off the air bases that show hits in an area that is used for parking aircraft, for parking combat aircraft. We don't know if anything was actually parked there, so we don't know if there were losses. But again, that one is an area where some potential damage has happened. At the moment I am filming, we still don't have pictures of Hetzarim 
or tell off. There is a biplane starting behind me. This is what happens when you film in an airport. So what are the first considerations? Well, the first is that probably the accuracy of the Iranian weapons doesn't seem to be that high. It is possible that they have hidden some of their best capabilities for a in case of a full-out war, but still it seems that the cluster of the targets is quite dispersed. 30 warheads on a larger base like this can do some damage, can create some problems to the operations, but they definitely are not enough to put it out of service. So the Iranian uh, ballistic missile arsenal is huge. It makes sense that they used several oldish weapons with large CEPs and a relative smaller number of more modern weapons, which are probably those that hit these potentially sensitive areas. However, it is clear how large air bases are a very difficult target, particularly if they are hardened. They just occupy too much space and you need to know where the aircraft are, you need to know where the ammo depot are, you, you need to know where the fuel depot is. Probably to cause any serious damage you would have needed three or four times the number of impacts. And probably Iran has enough weapons to do so, if they want it. However, what I consider the most important lesson is the fact that the Israeli EADS, which, mind, it has been built uh, with the American is not entirely indigenous, so it should represent the state of the art of Western anti ballistic missile defenses. Pretty much didn't work that well. I don't know, we can safely assume that there have been at least about 50 impacts, and that would be an effectiveness around 70 75 percent which is very, very, very different from what happened in April, where it was 99-98%. So it makes me think that something has happened, that the Iranian did something differently that caused issues to the Israeli air defenses. It, don't get me wrong, it's still a quite high success rate, but in case of a massive strike or in case of a massive repeated strikes, of this size or even a bit larger, then it could become critical. And probably Iran has about a thousand of oldish ballistic missiles that they can launch to deplete the Israeli air defenses. And the, the impact of that situation could be quite serious, I believe. So what happened is not irrelevant, is actually quite relevant. And the point is, well, these defenses can be penetrated. They are not airtight as they seemed to be in April. So I believe that for military planners in general, this is a really food for thought. If anything important emerges in the next few days and weeks, I will try to uh, do some shorts to keep you up to date. In the meanwhile, really, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, leave a comment, hit the bell, interact in any way with the channel. An enormous thank you as usual to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon or by any other of the available means. Uh, there is also a GoFundMe available now, which is actually connected with a book that I'm trying to, to prepare. It's a long-term project, but it is available. There will be a link in the description uh, to see what it, this is about if you are interested. Well, I suppose that this is the end. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you soon with something more conventional. Bye.